I'd seen enough. I decided to take action. My stomach twisted into a knot, but I somehow pulled myself together and walked over to the closet. I pulled out a small suitcase and a larger suitcase. I quickly and silently pulled clothes out of the closet and packed them into the larger bag, all of my belongings. It only took a minute or so to fill the suitcase. Hey. Moving to the dresser, I pulled out all the underwear and tossed everything, including undershirts, into the smaller bag. I then switched to the sock drawer. I had managed to pull out two large handfuls of socks when I heard Janet yell. Sorry to bother you, Janet, I apologized, stuffing the socks into the suitcase. I'll be gone in a few minutes and you can go back to letting Steve fuck you as you so colorfully described it. Tom, it's not what it seems. Steve is just a friend. He's going to leave right now. We need to talk, honey, suggested a visibly upset Janet. Steve, it would be better if you left now. Steve seemed to agree that leaving my bedroom was a good idea. However, his clothes were nowhere to be seen, and walking around naked in front of a very angry man is not something that most men think is beneficial to their overall well-being. Quite the opposite. Steve exercised good judgment and pulled the sheet up to his chin. I saw my old Ruger .22 caliber revolver in my desk drawer as I was removing the last handful of socks. I had even forgotten it was there. I had put it in that drawer so long ago that I had lost all memory of it. I realized that I must not have worn some of my socks very often. I raised my weapon and turned to face my wife, with whom I had lived for 23 years, and her lover. I walked over to the bed and sat on the edge next to Janet's lap. As I sat there with the gun in my hand, I realized there were some quick solutions to a rather confusing situation. Janet, it looks like you and Steve have been having fun like rabbits. Could you tell me which part I misinterpreted? Demanded I. Good heavens, Tom. Have you been here so long? I can't deny what you've seen or heard, but that doesn't mean I love you any less. It was just a silly affair, Tom. It meant nothing to me, Janet sobbed. It seems to me, Steve, that you should be a little disturbed by my loving wife's latest statement. It seems we both mean a hell of a lot to Janet, and our abilities under the sheets leave a lot to be desired. Perhaps she has someone else who has it better, and you and I are just substitutes to be used only when she can't find a real stud. Tom, don't say that. You're my only love and the best lover in the world. Please put the gun down and let Steve go. We can discuss this amongst ourselves. There's no need to drag Steve into our private conversations, Janet reasoned. Well, Janet, I think there is a very good reason. You and Steve have an intimate relationship. You don't need my horny ass sitting around moping and interfering with your hot monkey sex. Janet was already sobbing profusely, and Steve was squirming in pain. I put the gun down next to Janet and stood up. I briefly considered killing myself with the revolver, but a fucking .22 caliber could only damage my brain, blind me, or inflict some other non-lethal but painful injury. I didn't need to rush to my death. It was always an option, albeit a fairly permanent one. I would never hurt Janet, and what use was Steve to me anyway? Janet was an attractive woman and could always find another lover while I had been giving in to Bubba's desires for 20 years. I realized the situation wasn't so dire. I zipped up my second bag and got up to leave. Straightening up, I stood with my back to the bed and its occupants. I heard the unmistakable sound I've always called dry fire. It is the sound made when a fired cartridge case hits an empty chamber. I always keep the cartridge in the empty chamber. I even keep the next chamber empty, just to be safe, since that chamber is in line with the pin when the bolt is cocked. I must not have heard the sound of the gun cocking while I was buckling the case. I knew that if the gun was cocked again, it would go off. Then I heard the distinctive sound of the old revolver's trigger being pulled back. Without even looking at the bed, I rushed to the doorway. I almost succeeded in getting out unharmed. To get down the stairs, I had to turn left after leaving the bedroom. As I turned, I felt something hit my forehead. The pain was something between a strong bite and a sharp blow from a hammer. Instinctively, I dropped the bag from my left hand. Blood was already dripping into my left eye when I ran my hand across my forehead. I felt more blood and a bump. My head was already spinning, but I was too scared to slow my step. I traversed the stairs mostly by memory. I barely managed to open the front door because my hand was covered in blood, and there was no way I could grasp it. 
I looked around frantically and realized that the suitcase remaining in my hand was only half closed. I grabbed a sock and cleaned the handle enough to turn it. I ran to my car and sped away as fast as I could. Every couple minutes, I pulled another sock out of my bag and used it to wipe the blood from my eyes so I could see and drive. Getting shot in the head was far less agonizing than the time spent in the emergency room of the local hospital. The questions were endless, ranging from the name of the insurance company to my potential killer. In a nutshell, it all boiled down to the fact that the small lead bullet was easily extracted from under my skin and a few stitches were placed. That was the easy part. The police were called as there had been a shooting. I had to give unpleasant details about how I had been feeling bad at work and came home before dinner to catch my wife and accountant doing horizontal mambo. I told how I picked up the gun, briefly considered sticking the cap in my undersized brain, but eventually put the weapon on the bed and tried to leave. Mr. Moore, who shot you? The policeman asked. Did you actually see the shooter? I didn't see who the shooter was, but for you, officer, I've narrowed it down to two suspects, I replied sarcastically. You'll have to proceed from there. Do you believe your wife is capable of shooting you, Mr. Moore? He repeated insistently. Try finding out that your wife of 23 years has been sleeping with your fucking accountant and then ask her if she can shoot you. You'll suddenly realize you have no idea who she is or what she can do. To answer your question, it's a distinct possibility, I admitted sadly. I was still in the emergency room and wondered why. My head was stitched up and the bleeding had long since stopped. I noticed that the doctor who performed the surgery was showing my chart to some guy in a white jacket. I guess they were wondering if I even had a brain in my head. The policeman stepped back and the doctor approached me. I didn't like his demeanor when he asked to speak to me alone. Mr. Moore, I am very concerned about your heart. You told me that lately you have been feeling tired and sometimes even nauseous. I urge you to stay here until we can run some tests to determine the severity of your condition. It may turn out that being in the hospital today saved your life. Shit, butter my ass and call me a biscuit, groaned I. I'm a lucky bastard. Lucky my accountant slept with my wife. Lucky I came home early and caught them. Lucky one of them shot me in the head. It's going pretty good, Doc. Let's get it over with while I'm on a roll. Turns out the head wound never really bothered me much. Because within a couple days, I was open like a fucking clam for quadruple bypass surgery. Janet tried to see me before the surgery and again when I was recovering. I refused to see her. Both of my children were wonderful. My son, TJ, took a leave of absence from his job in Texas and flew down to be with me while I recovered. My daughter, Jillian, attended a local university and was able to be my advocate while I was unconscious. Never go to the hospital without someone you trust looking out for you. Janet's parents even came and spent time with me. I was inundated with advice. Everyone felt I needed to sit down with Janet and discuss the situation, as it was euphemistically called. I held out for a few days, but finally gave in. I agreed on the condition that our children and Janet's parents attend. I wanted everyone to understand my reasoning and my position. The kids brought me home from the hospital. Janet and her parents met us in the living room. It was the first time I had seen Janet since that fateful day. She looked like shit. That fact brought me some satisfaction. I sat down on the couch, the kids positioned on either side of me. Janet sat in the chair across from me, and her parents sat in the love seat to my left. Janet started the dance with a few what I thought were very silly questions. Tom, how could you suggest to the police that I might have been the one to shoot you? I would never hurt you, honey. You should know that, having lived with me all these years. I love you, she confessed. Why didn't you let me visit you in the hospital? After all, I should be the one to be by your side and help you regain your health. Let me answer those questions, Dad, Jillian offered. Mom, you betrayed your father in the marital bed. He never thought you could do that to him. When he realized what you could and wanted, Dad realized he had no idea what you were capable of and told the police. You would have caused him even more stress if you had been allowed to see him before or after the surgery. He needs love and understanding, not a cheating whore wife. And I was surprised that my daughter understood my train of thought so well. Why didn't Janet know all this without asking stupid questions? Jillian, 
I'm still your mother, and I don't like you talking to me like that, Janet protested. <laughs> you should have thought about that before committing yourself to this man, snapped Janet's mother. You haven't earned your daughter's respect. You did a terrible thing, so don't act like you're above a good whipping. Janet was stunned when her mother basically lashed out at her with her words. She had probably expected her parents to be supportive, or at least neutral. Okay, I made a terrible mistake. It only happened once, and Tom caught me. I'm ashamed and embarrassed of my actions, but that doesn't mean I don't love Tom with all my heart, Janet pleaded. I made a terrible error in judgment. I want to atone for my sins. So, Mom, is our family some sort of revival religion where you stand up in front of everyone and admit you've sinned and then you get forgiveness? TJ asked. Maybe Dad could baptize you and wash away your sins and your memories? Is that how you think it's supposed to work? Everyone seemed to pounce on Janet, and I liked it a hell of a lot. Her parents and kids were giving her real hell. I spent most of my mind thinking about revenge on that bitch. What better way to do that than by attacking her closest blood relatives? No, TJ, no, Janet burst out. I don't have an answer, except that I know your father is a wonderful, gentle, loving husband and father. I just hope that my absolute remorse and my love for him is due to something. I really need him, and I think he needs me. Well, honey, I spoke for the first time, and the sarcasm flowed off my tongue. Do you belong to Steve now? I wouldn't want you to be an Indian giver or anything like that. Whoever's the better man took the spoils of victory. I lied. Okay, it was just pillow talk. No one owns me or my body parts but you, darling, Janet replied. I'm willing to give you everything I have and everything I am if you'll forgive me. R Why should I believe you didn't mean what you said to Steve? Objected I. I think you were sincere. You called me a lying, cheating whore, Tom. Now you want things to be different. You're trying to force me to tell the truth. You're contradicting yourself, Janet reasoned. Am I a liar or am I telling the truth? I'd bet on a liar, I replied coldly. You don't have a very strong argument, Janet. You tell me you lie to men and Steve was just another victim. How many men have you given yourself to? Do you have a list or something? Are they all homicidal maniacs? Is there anyone else waiting to put a bullet in my forehead? Between you and that damn quack doctor, there's not much left to my heart. That would be a very small target. Tom! I swear Steve was the one, and to be honest, you caught us the second time we were together. I had no idea he was such a tightwad. He literally wet the bed when you pulled the gun out of the drawer. When you put it on the floor, he grabbed it as fast as he could. Bringing a loaded gun to a man who is scared to death is not the smartest thing you could have done, Janet finished. Well, pardon the hell out of me. I didn't see a fucking manual on what to do when you catch your wife having fun with another man in your bed. I had no idea what to do. Why didn't it occur to us to discuss this possibility earlier? You should have known you were a cheating whore. What were you planning when I caught you? I demanded fiercely. <laughs> Honestly, I never thought it would happen, but if there's ever a next time, please just shoot me, Janet replied. It would be so much better than going through this nightmare. My own parents and children have no respect for me, and the only man I love unconditionally despises me. I almost got you killed. A bullet to the head would have been kinder, though I deserve to suffer. I know it. There was silence for a moment. I don't think any of us realized what it was doing to Janet. Her life had become a living hell. Again, the thought gave me considerable pleasure. I don't think there's much else to discuss here. I finally broke the silence. I'm divorcing you, Janet. I don't have a choice. I have a choice with terms and conditions. Get a good lawyer because I'm going to put you on the hook. I have to do this to keep some self-respect. My lawyer will be in touch. The kids have picked out some apartments for me to look at, and our first meeting is in a few minutes. You broke my heart, Janet, and even the doctors couldn't fix it. Goodbye. Janet only bowed her head and sobbed. Her parents walked the kids and me to the door without saying anything. It was frustrating as hell. Funny how things happen. If I hadn't been shot in the head and sent to the hospital, I probably would have died in a couple of weeks, if not less. That's what the doctors told me. Basically, I was lucky that Janet chose that moment in our marriage to cheat on me. It probably saved my life.
Nevertheless, it was very hard for me to think of it as anything other than the worst thing that had ever happened to me. Fortunately, I had a good job and very good insurance. Janet started working after the children left home. She worked part-time at a department store and didn't bring home much money. My attorney offered Janet's legal advisor an unfair, totally unacceptable settlement. We had to start somewhere and could always negotiate down. I was stunned when my lawyer told me that Janet had agreed to it. Against her lawyer's advice. No, we had a mortgage on a house she would never be able to afford. I was getting the lion's share of the savings and equity. She received no alimony. It would be impossible for her to survive. I was sure of it. And then another stroke of luck came into my life. Like in the movies, I bought a lottery ticket that turned out to be a winner. It was worth several million dollars, and I was immediately afraid that Janet would get some of it. So I didn't tell anyone about the winnings. I carried it in my wallet, and often when I was alone, I would pull it out and fondle it. I obsessively thought about him and what he could buy for me. As time went on, the loneliness increased and the pleasure I got from holding the winning ticket diminished. I had already earned all the money I needed, especially since I would soon be a bachelor. So why was I so miserable and getting even more miserable? It certainly wasn't money problems. I took a week's vacation and went fishing on the Delaware River. I spent almost every daylight hour on the river fishing. More accurately, I was fishing and thinking. After dark, I would drink beer and think. By the time the week came to an end, I had decided on a plan of action. Janet's parents agreed to meet me at my apartment on Sunday night. They were sworn to secrecy and not to tell anyone that I had invited them over. Bill, I have a favor to ask of you, I addressed my father-in-law. If you can't honor my request, could you keep the information I'm about to reveal a closely guarded secret? I think I can agree to that, Tom, unless it's something I feel must be disclosed to save a life or something, Bill added. I bought a lottery ticket a couple months ago, and he won, Bill. It pays out a little over four million if you take an annuity. That's great for you, Tom. Congratulations. What do you want from us? Are you asking us not to tell Janet about this? A suddenly dejected Bill asked. Yes, Bill. She must never find out that I bought that ticket, I insisted. Tom, you're putting us in a difficult situation. You can see that, can't you? Doris, my mother-in-law, asked. Not really, Doris. I want you to tell Janet that you bought the ticket. I want you to divide it between Janet and the children, each getting a third. But please don't tell anybody that I bought the ticket. No one will question you giving the ticket to your only child and grandchildren. It's perfectly legal, and it will help the children and save Janet's life, I said. Doris had tears running down her cheeks, and Bill cleared his throat and looked out the window. It didn't take a very sensitive person to realize that they were truly touched by my offer. I felt better than I had ever felt since the day I'd come home early that morning and found Janet in bed with that asshole. It was just what I needed to finally begin the emotional healing. Tom will gladly go along with your deception, Bill smirked. You know Janet doesn't go out and has started working longer hours to make the mortgage payment on time. She really feels like shit. She knows she screwed up big time, and it's not because of the money. Bill has never been prone to being verbose. He spent 25 years as a firefighter in New York City and called things by their proper names. His daughter's behavior hurt him and Doris almost as much as it hurt me. A week later, I received the most bizarre news imaginable from my attorney. My crazy, soon-to-be ex-wife had asked her lawyer to contact mine, informing him that she had extra income to declare and that I was entitled to half. What the hell kind of lawyer does she have? I told him to let her idiot lawyer know that I would not accept any share and that she could keep everything. When it came time for the divorce hearing, we never agreed on the distribution of the lottery money. Both sides refused to budge from their positions. My attorney told me that he should drop my case because I was ruining his reputation as a barracuda. He smiled when he mentioned this. The judge was shocked. That's what he told us. Then he did something I thought he would never do. He refused to grant the divorce. I don't believe anyone in this case would be better off if the state granted this suit, he began. I've never seen both sides in a divorce fight like this over money. It makes me question the need for a divorce. Perhaps counseling or just an open dialogue between the parties would help resolve this issue. 
He told our attorneys to keep working on a settlement and to reconsider in a month. He encouraged Janet and I to discuss things as soon as possible. I left the courtroom completely confused. Janet's parents attended the hearing and Bill approached me in the parking lot. Tom, I'm asking you as a favor to stop by your house right now. We'll have a sandwich each, have a beer, and try to work things out. You're two of the most stubborn people I've ever seen, he admonished, leaving without waiting for my response. Janet opened the door when I rang the bell. She looked pale but was otherwise quite well. She barely met my gaze as she turned and led me into the kitchen. Her folks had cold cuts and everything we needed to make sandwiches we could eat in a week. Bill handed me a cold beer. Tom, I'm the one who made this whole mess, so I want to speak first. My parents bought the winning lottery ticket and gave it to me and the kids to split. You already know that. You're entitled to half of my share since we were, in fact still are, married when the kids and I turned it in, Janet explained. I have a selfish reason for wanting you to get half. It will help me forgive myself for the terrible mistake I made toward you. I know you can't forgive me, but I couldn't forgive myself either, and it really, really hurts. It's not about the money, Tom. It's about me finally doing something right and fair to you. You deserve better than I gave you. Please accept the money, and I'll agree to the divorce. You will be free of me. Bill and Doris watched me carefully, waiting for my answer. I pondered the question for a long time. I don't think money should have anything to do with forgiving yourself, Janet. What you did was terrible, but it's over with. If you'll just accept the money and agree to the terms of the divorce, I'll get closure. If it helps, I forgive you. It took a while and more than one mug of beer, but I forgave you. I wish it had never happened, but we can't change the past. I loved you, Janet. I still do. But I can't trust you so I can't be married to you. I don't want you to lose your home or suffer because of me. I'm not very proud to admit that the rest of the arrangement is heavily in my favor, so just accept the money your parents gave you. I won't do that, Tom. I'll fight this all the way to the Supreme Court if I have to, Janet said somewhat dramatically. For heaven's sake, Bill shouted, shocking everyone else. This is so damn pathetic I can't stand it. Janet screwed up and broke your heart, Bill. You can't stay married to a cheater, and that's exactly what she is. Janet needs some goddamn absolution or something before she'll agree to a divorce. Does that make sense? Bill continued as Janet and I nodded uncomplainingly. Then here's my suggestion. Take it for what it's worth. Janet, give the poor bastard a divorce and keep his dignity. He deserves it from you. Tom, after the divorce, go back to the house and blow Janet's brains out any damn time you want. Treat her like a whore if you want. I don't care. She needs you to take care of her, and you're still in love with that stupid cow. You won't be able to trust her for a while, if ever. It's a given. Janet, if this man is stupid enough to move in with you and sleep with your slutty cow, do you agree to be faithful to him and also agree that he might resort to some very harsh measures to keep you honest? You're the kind of woman who seems to need the threat of a firm hand applied in the right place. Dad... I'll do anything to get Tom to move back in with me. I promise, Tom, you'll never have a reason to regret it, Janet exclaimed fervently. That was it. Bill's half-lived idea of a solution to my dilemma was on the table. I would get my divorce, and my self-respect would return. Janet would have a breadwinner and a chance to prove me right. I knew it was a completely bullshit idea. You'd have to be crazy to take Bill up on his offer. I smiled and held out my hand to Bill as Janet burst into tears.